Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Over the next hour, we have a great lineup of guests for you, which include Olympic Judo medalist, Pan Am Games medalist, and Judo World Championship medalist, a lady who fought Ronda Rousey in her younger days, the great Marty Malloy. We also have an interview with Bellator light heavyweight fighter fresh off his win with Satoshi Ashi in Dublin, Ireland, King Mo, a.k.a. Muhammad Lawal. Be sure to check out our website at www.mawradio.com for the advertisement for the ultimate destination for martial arts and MMA expo, which is going to be taking place January 27th to 29th at the Tropicana Casino Hotel in Atlantic City. This week's inspirational quote is from Bruce Lee and goes as follows. If you always put limits on everything you do, physical or anything else, it will spread into your work and into your life. There are no limits. There are only plateaus. And you must not stay there. You must go beyond them. Lee Jun Fan, a.k.a. Bruce Lee, 1940 to 1973. This is Olivier Gruner. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Mohamed Lawal, a.k.a. King Mo, is a light heavyweight fighter with Bellator, with a record of 20 wins and 5 losses. I had the opportunity to speak with him recently, in which he shared some interesting perspectives and insights on preparing for a fight, his future goals, and on his favorite martial arts movie stars. Mohamed, thanks very much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, man, no problem, bro. How much of your preparation for a fight is psychological versus physical? I think it's like 50-50. It's actually, no way, it depends because if you wake up feeling sore one day, it might be 70-30 psychological. If you wake up feel, you know, feeling like you're on top of the world, it might be 50-50, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just depends on the situation, you know what I'm saying, and how tired you are, how fresh you feel. And in terms of strategy, how far along in your preparation for a fight do you begin to strategize? I don't know because... I'm going to be real with you. Like, I, be, I train all year round pretty much. So I really don't do camps. I just say I do, but I really don't. I'm always in the gym. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it'll be two weeks. Sometimes it'll be three weeks. I just pick three weeks and just do like, all right, here's my game plan. Bam. My game plan is usually always the same. Keep the fight and my strengths and then their weaknesses. And I see what their weaknesses are. You know what I'm saying? And what their strengths are. Because my thing is I don't want their fight, the fight to be in their strengths. I want I want the fight to be my weaknesses, so I just got to figure out, you know, what what is what. Muhammad, what would you consider to be your foundation or base style? Whatever works, you know. What I'm saying like, if I have to wrestle somebody, I wrestle. If they want to box, I box. You know, if I have to grind, I grind. If I have to look for that big punch, I look for that big punch. Just whatever they give me, you know. Um, you know, I just I just try to take. And you have multiple strengths, so are there certain areas that you prefer to capitalize on over others? You know, it depends on the opponent. Because say the guy's like, say the guy's like um, 6'4", um, with the 84-inch reach, I guess, or 83-inch reach, guess what? I can't be on the outside, so i got to find a way to get on the inside and avoid the knees and keep the fight there totally yeah. tight. That'll be my strength, you know what I'm saying? So, sure. You know, say the guy's a great jiu guy. My goal is not to be on the ground with them, so I got to use my wrestling, my take that defense to keep the fight in my strengths, which is on my feet. So what I'm hearing is that adaptability is important. It's key. Yeah, that's building a fight IQ. You know what I'm saying? Because the guy's not that small fight IQ, and I can, I can, I can finesse him to be in any position I want to be in. As you're going through your strategy and preparation, are there other members of your team who you depend on to help you with your strategy? Yeah, man, I got a lot of people like um. I got my boy Rodney Verges out there in Chicago. I got my boy Kess Quash in California. I got my boy Brother Fareed Tamad in Vegas. Uh, Jeff Mayweather in Vegas. My boy uh, Nathan Vasquez in Vegas. Um, Coach Anthony out there in uh, Philly, uh, Delray, New Jersey. Uh, my boy Gary Clark here in Florida. All my coaches, you know, co- the coaches of the American Tide team. I got um, uh, uh, um, Coach Conan, Cami Barzini. Dean, um, Dean Thomas, you know, I, I even Coach Pahumpa. I, I, you know, I, I have at least 12 people that I, you know, that I, I run through game plan stuff with. I have an idea, so what I do is I just run it by them and 
usually it's, it'll be a bubble and a lot of bubbles will overlap and I'll just pick the spots to overlap because a lot of, a lot of the game plans will overlap each other and there'll be one common or two or three common things that they're all saying. And I'll be like, okay, okay, I saw this. Check, check, check. Oh, I didn't see this. They're all saying this. Let me look into that. And then that's what I do. Mohammed, that sounds like a very wise way to approach it. And it also sounds like you've got a strong team and you're extremely confident in them. Yeah, very confident in them. Mohammed, from where and who do you draw your inspiration? My family and friends, man. You know, like, family and friends, you need to, you need to inspire, inspire yourself, too. You need to look within yourself to see if, you, if, if you're built for it. You know what I'm saying? And I got family and friends, and I got self belief. And, uh, you know, hope so show that I'm built for this. Leading up to the fight, what is the most challenging part of the preparation for you psychologically? Is it nervousness? Is it anticipatory nausea? Is it going over the fight in your head? What is the most challenging part of that? Try not to be too relaxed. Okay. You know, because I've competed so much. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't care. So I'm just kind of like last days ago. I got to be like, get up. Like, okay, let's go. Because me, I'm not that person. I don't, you know, I don't get loud and excited. Like, co- like I don't let my coach to yell at me. Like, they talk to me. In between corners, I don't need somebody to hype me up. I'm like, let's go. Let's fucking go. No, I don't need that. Just talk to me, man. You know what I'm saying? And I'll get myself up. You know what I'm saying? That's the hardest thing. Is I can get up, but sometimes, like, you're still so relaxed. You, you feel so confident. You're kind of like, huh. Nah, you know, so just getting up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can get up and stuff, but. That's the hardest thing for me to do is to get up because I'm always motivated to train. But come fight time, I feel like I'm already won just because I've trained so hard that i got to like kind of remind myself, like, okay, the fight's going to happen still. Mohammed, when you look back and you recollect your first professional fight, how have you changed since then? Uh, my fight IQ has gotten better. Um, but as far as my first, it's still the same. Nothing's changed, really, because I, I think it's, like, you know, I came from a wrestling background. I had great coaches with a high wrestling IQ, but I was a big boxing fan. I have a high IQ for combat. So I just kind of just, I'm like methodical in my approach. And I just kind of like, you know, just yeah, I stay calm and, just do, you know, hit the switch. When, you, when you're walking, the, walking to the cage or the ring, it's when you hit your switch. When you step into the cage on fight night, how conscious are you going to be of the crowd and the cameras, or are you just going to be focused on the opponent in front of you? I'm very conscious. I'm almost too. That's why I'm too relaxed. I, I can, I can, I sometimes like I'm fighting. I look in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, there's so and so. Oh, damn. I, in my first fight, I remember when I fight in Goku, I was like, oh, there goes Josh Barnett. Oh, there's so and so. Oh, there, is, that, is that Akiyama? Oh, it looks like him. There's a Yokozuna. Uh, he's a Yokozuna? No, he's a sumo wrestler, though. I, I'm, I'm aware just because, like, when I was wrestling, there'd be times, like, when you're wrestling, you have a coach, you have to, you get to, you have tunnel vision, but at the same time, you have to know when to erase the tunnel vision to hear the outside information that's being provided to you. Muhammad, how does Bellator differ from other fight promotions in which you have competed? You know what? They're all kind of the same. So with Bellator, I feel like the, I just feel, I feel free. I, I can be myself. You know, I, I love Scott Coker. We'll love work with him. We'll work with the staff. Um, the fan base is different because I feel like it's more diverse in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, people from all over. Like all just the walks of life, because if you look no normal, normal okay, MMA crowd, it's just like a bunch of like, like just college age kids just drinking beer, yelling f them up. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And uh, I, I feel like I feel like those sort of crowds are a lot different. You know, I, I, I don't know it just seems different to me. I've been I've been to a lot of MMA events. Japan is probably the most different because Japan like they're more knowledgeable as far as fight, fight IQ and what's going on, but. Just Bellator just seems more like, I don't know, it just feels like a different vibe to it. Mohammed, you mentioned that you're a very relaxed fighter in the cage. Are you, in general, a very relaxed person in everyday life? Yeah, man, I don't do, I'm a homebody. I watch TV, listen to music, and I just train. I'm always training. I like being in the gym. So, like, if I'm not, say I take a day off, i am probably watch TV or i watch some fight films, some boxing, or go, I, I got a boxing channel I'm on Facebook, talk boxing. We share videos, share game plans, talk about upcoming fights. I love boxing. Um, talk, I text with my boys. Or I go to the gym and just watch people train. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, fighting's a lifestyle. So right now, because I'm a fighter, I love the fighter lifestyle. 
Now, once I'm done fighting, then things have to change. So I'll just find a way to take away to something else. Muhammad, who's your favorite martial artist of all time? Donnie Yen. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I like, I like, you know, I'm, I was big, growing up, I was big on Kung Fu plays. Gordon Wu as well. I love Gordon Wu. I love Jack Chan. I love Jet Li. Samo Hung. Um, Michelle Yeoh. I was a big, like, Kung Fu foot person. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, I, that was, that was my favorite. You know what I'm saying? And just, I don't know, it is weird because, like, mixed martial arts, I, I respect them all. I, I like them all because they're the world with, with, we're, um, coworkers, but, just martial arts, I like the Asian martial arts, and I like the fight choreography martial arts the best. <laughs> Even though it's not real, I'm a big fan of that stuff because I know I can't do it, and it's mystical, and it's not real, but I wish it was real. At what age did you begin taking instruction in martial arts or combat sports? Uh, when I was 16, wrestling, because wrestling is martial arts, so I started wrestling at 16. And what was the motivation for you to get into competitive MMA? Well, I was a fan of it for one and two. I was broke after the Olympic trial, so I had no other option. I was like, I know, I was like, I'm not going to coach wrestling because, as a wrestling coach, I was making, I was a volunteer coach making five hundred dollars a month. I can't live, I can't live up to that. Maybe a thousand dollars tops. I'm like, what can I do with a thousand dollars a month? Nothing. So you know what? I'm going to try. You know what? MMA is getting big. I hear what I heard what these guys are making. That's good money. Let me jump up in there and see what I can do. So, Muhammad, when you're stepping into the cage, what makes you distinctive and unique from other professional MMA fighters? Uh, I really don't know. You know what I'm saying? I just think that just I'm just the realness in me. I'm just a real dude, man. Like it's not about the fight because we all fight. So when we're in all the cage, we're all kind of like we fight differently. But we're all there to fight and win, but. I think it's how we are outside the cage, you know, as far as like personality and demeanor and what you stand for. That's what makes you different. Great answer. Muhammad, do you have advice that you will share with our listeners who are amateur mixed martial artists who someday hope to compete as professionals? Yeah, I got a few things. Stop being a fan before you jump in the game. Come in the game as a person that's looking to be a winner because a lot of people come to the game wanting to just be somewhere and be part of something, and they don't. They, they never make it. They're just fans. For instance, the guys that fight at shows, they, after they lose, they want to take pictures of everybody on the show. Don't be that guy. Number two, get with a good team that will help build you and, show you and point you in the right direction. Number three, do not stop learning, because the moment you stop learning is when you start losing. Mohammed, terrific interview, and here is our wrap-up question for this interview, and I thank you once again. Future goals, what do you envision as your future goals moving forward? I don't know. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind like, you know, doing do, do type of civil rights stuff or and when I'm done, civil rights stuff. After my career, sometimes civil rights stuff is just working for the, you know, working for the cause to help other people, you know, um, mentoring or something. You know, when it's all said and done, that's what I'd like to do. Mohammed, thanks very much for your candor and for answering our questions today, and we wish you all the very best on Fight Night. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. This has been an interview with Bellator fighter King Mo Mohammed Lawal. Hi, I'm Don the Dragon Wilson, and you're listening to Joseph Clark at Martial Arts World Radio. For those of you listening to Martial Arts World Radio while well, on your phones, tablets, or laptops, be sure to check out www bobwallworldblackbelt.com that's bobwallworldblackbelt.com the world's foremost martial arts online community hi this is superfoot and you're listening to martial arts world radio here is a little history lesson on ed parker promoter of one of the oldest annual major karate tournaments in the country and one of the first instructors on the mainland ed parker learned kenpo in his hometown of honolulu under William Chow. He opened his first dojo in 1954 near Brigham Young University in Utah and subsequently taught accredited karate classes on campus to city police, state highway patrolmen, fish and game wardens, and sheriff's deputies. In 1956, after graduating from BYV with a BA in sociology and psychology, he opened his first California studio in Pasadena, eventually expanding his chain to include dojos throughout the U.S., Ireland, Germany, and Chile. 
His students include karate notables Tom Kelly, Steve Sanders, Steve LaBounty, Ralph Castellanos, and J.T. Will, plus a long list of celebrities Elvis Presley, Blake Edwards, the late Nick Adams, Robert Culp, Robert Wagner, Audie Murphy, Bronislaw Caper, Joey Bishop, Darren McGavin, McDonald Carey, Warren Beatty, Frank Lovejoy, and Elk Summer. Parker has been on the covers of Black Belt magazines, Inside Kung Fu, and Professional Karate, and has written or been interviewed in many others. In August 1964, Parker originated the annual International Karate Championships in Long Beach, California, historic. And in 1965, he co-promoted with Ralph Castro the first California Karate Championships in San Francisco. He also fathered the Hawaii versus Mainland Team Championships in Honolulu. At the 1975 Internationals, he awarded the largest cash prize, $16,250, ever given in a Pro-Am tournament. Named the most outstanding contributor to karate for the years 1961-70 to by the U.S. Championships in Dallas, Parker also received an award for outstanding officiating at the 5th U.S. Championships. Other events in which he has served as a referee or judge include the June Renationals in Washington, D.C. in 65-66 and the 10th British Karate Association Championships in 1974. Also, the Aaron Banks East Coast versus West Coast Championships in 1969 and several others. Parker has staged demonstrations for such dignitaries and celebrities as former California Governor Ronald Reagan, former Vice President Spiro Agnew, Gary Cooper, and Mae West, and for organizations like the Century Club, an organization working with physically disabled children, Boy Scouts, Elks, and Rotary Clubs, and various high schools and colleges. In 1974, he led a tour of Europe that included tournament fighters Benny the Jet Yurkidas, John Natividad, Darnell Garcia, and Tom Kelly. The motion pictures Parker has appeared in are The Wrecking Crew, Money Jungle, and The Devil's Choice, in which he co-starred. His television acting credits include The Rebel, I Spy, The Courtship of Eddie's Father, and The Lucy Show. As an author, he has written six instructional texts, Kenpo Karate, Secrets of Chinese Karate, The Women's Guide to Self-Defense, The Basic Booklet, Ed Parker's Guide to the Nunchaku, and Manual for Training of Law Enforcement Personnel. Also important to note is amongst his students are Jeff Speakman and Chuck Norris. Ed Parker passed over December 15, 1990, at the age of 59, his contribution to martial arts is legendary. This is UFC fighter Alex Ricci. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Marty Malloy is a U.S. Olympic team judoka who has earned medals at the Olympic, Pan Am Games, and World Judo Championships. She fought Ronda Rousey in her younger days, and she has traveled to all corners of the globe many times over as part of her journey to pursue personal excellence in judo. She, ha- she has a degree in advertising from San Jose State University, where she was judo team captain for three years. Marty, thanks very much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Marty, can we begin by you taking us back to your 2012 Olympic experience? Sure. Well, the, what a lot of people don't know is that for judo, the qualification process uh, takes two years. So... Starting in about April of 2010, myself and the rest of Team USA were competing and training on a constant basis because in order to qualify for the Olympics, you need to win medals at qualifying tournaments, and then those medals give you points, which increase your ranking. So for women, you have to be top 20, or sorry, top 14, and for men, you have to be top 20 in the world. And the only way you can rise in those rankings is by winning medals. And for me, um, going into London, I went in number 12. So you can see that I was only a couple slots away of, away from not making the cut exactly. So that was all achieved by basically traveling to places like Japan, Croatia, Russia, Brazil, I mean, you name it, to do training camps with the women that I could possibly be fighting in London and also to compete and win those medals to get that higher ranking. So I guess you could say it was 
it was a little bit of a stressful time for me. It was my second time trying to make an Olympic team, and I was kind of just asking myself constantly, "Am I going to make this? Am I going to get the results I need to make it?" And then, fortunately, I went to the Paris Grand Slam, which is one of the hardest judo tournaments on the planet, in February. And you have to keep in mind that the cutoff for Olympic qualification was June, and we still weren't 100 percent sure that I was going to qualify and ended up taking a bronze medal, which basically solidified it without question that I was going to be going to London. Marty, why the difference between the number of women qualifiers versus men? Is that because of weight class? Well, there are 14 weight classes in judo, seven for men and seven for women, but I think it's more because the men's divisions are larger. They're just way more contested. So to have 100 men in, let's say, the 60-kilo category and – in the women's 48, which is the the same lightweight category for women, um, you would have up to maybe 50 or 60 in that category. You need to allocate more spots because there are more people competing. At least that's how I understand it. So during those two years where you were qualifying and competing, were you focused on the long-term goal of making it to the Olympics, or were you just taking it one match at a time and focusing on this match? It's funny that you ask that because it's actually a little bit of a conundrum that we tend to run into, um, at least in judo. It's because, you know, you'll go to a tournament and maybe you won't perform well or, or maybe you'll you'll take a medal but your performance wasn't so good. And, you know, it's easy to get down on yourself, but our Olympic coaches or our national coaches all the time would remind me, Marty, this is, this is money in the bank that you're going to cash in on at the Olympics. You lose now so you can learn now and make improvements now so that you can win later. And so in those moments of, like, disappointment, it was easy to to lean on that and say, okay, this isn't the most important thing at this moment. But at the same time, for my own personal personality, that was not something I like to do. And that's because, for me, every single match is important, and I want to win every single tournament. Yes, the Olympics are the biggest one and the most well-known about, but for me, winning every single event I went to was the ultimate goal every time. So I kind of tried to balance those two ideals throughout the process. Marty, during the time that you were doing these preliminary qualifier bouts, did that give you the opportunity to get acclimated so that you were able to manage the nerves and manage the surreal aspects of competing in, for example, the Olympics or the Pan Am Games to ensure that you weren't overwhelmed by the just the awe of the moment when you did compete in the Olympics? Surprisingly for me, uh, being in London, I completely checked out from the grandiosity of it all. Like walking out and having the crowd screaming, it's it's a big thing. And you kind of come to this realization in that moment that this is the Olympics, this is what I've always wanted. But somehow, and I think it's why I performed as well as I did, I was able to completely disregard that which is funny because like I said we compete so often and there are tournaments in on some island off the coast of Venezuela where I'm walking out to fight and I'm more nervous than I was fighting at the Olympics or for example we compete in Brazil a lot where judo is almost practically one of the number one sports and you walk out into that stadium and it's deafening the screaming and the beating on the drum so it it really comes down to the individual person and how they focus and or will stay focused on what you're there to do and not let the things around you distract you. So I guess I could say I was a little bit lucky in London to have been able to put that behind me and just focus on the task at hand. Marty, you brought up something a moment ago, which I think is really important. It's something that I teach my kids and it's a philosophy that I live by. And I remind myself that we learn more from our losses than we do from our victories. And sometimes these are really tough lessons, but they are invaluable lessons. Was it a balancing act for you to constantly manage your confidence level as you're going through these bouts? Because you're aiming to hopefully get on the Olympic team and be a champion at the Olympics. But of course, you're going to experience some losses during these qualifiers. So when you did experience losses, did you have to manage your self-confidence so that it didn't get damaged and affect you along the way? Absolutely. I mean, you you never want to lose. And 
it's easy when you win to say to go back to training and just keep doing things exactly how you were doing them. You're riding that high of being successful and having had the things you're working on work out. But I always feel like the the champions are the people who are the ones in the most danger because one, everyone's studying the one who is performing the best and taking all the results, and two, they're not constantly trying to reinvent. Or I mean, if they're smart, they are. And I learned to do that over the years, even when I won. I learned to be very critical of myself and say, you know, even though you won, you did this really badly, and this could have been done a lot better. And it, it does suck a little bit because, you know, in, when you have a string of losses, you're forced to say, oh, my gosh, there's so many things I need to change and work on. And I don't think that's necessarily true either. It all comes down to so many different factors that um, influence your performance that day, whether it's your weight cut, whether – it's how focused you were, or like we just talked about, what kind of setting you're in, what kind of crowd is surrounding you. Did you change weight categories during your competitive career? I did at one point. I originally started out fighting on the international scene when I was 16, and I was fighting 57 kilos, which is about 125 pounds. And I couldn't get past the number one girl in front of me. Her name was Valerie Gote, and she was a really experienced fighter and actually ended up becoming one of my really good friends after I moved up the weight category. And I moved up one because I was young (laughs) as a freshman in college and I was struggling making weight because I'd recently moved to California and didn't know that eating a one pound burrito every night for dinner wasn't good for you. (laughs) So I was making my weight category and at the same time, the weight category above mine was kind of open. There wasn't any strong rigid person holding that weight so I said screw it I'll give it a try and I ended up being number one in the 63 kilo category for about a year or two I went to a world championships and a Pan Am Games and I took fifth at the Pan Am Games and I took ninth at the world at a weight category that I had never fought at before which ninth isn't anything to write home about necessarily but like I was so proud sure um but then um then after the girl above me uh, moved on and retired, and I realized that if I managed my weight correctly and worked with the nutritionist and did things like a professional would, I could make the 57 kilo category. So I've been back fighting 57 kilos for about maybe more than 10 years. Marty, on a previous episode of the show, I interviewed Nia Nicole Abdallah, a Taekwondo silver medalist from the Olympics, who stated that she didn't feel when she won the silver medal, that she had won. She actually stated that she felt she had lost because she was aiming for the gold. So she felt she had failed her mission and her objective. And it wasn't until she got home and a few weeks later when she started to, I guess, come down from the Olympic experience that it sunk in that she had accomplished something. And a lot of people, friends and family around her, of course, were praising her for this accomplishment of getting a silver medal in the Olympics. But she found it really difficult at first because she felt that she had failed. She wanted to get a gold, and the silver meant that she had lost. Did you experience anything like this, or what is your comment on that? Yeah, no, I I know. I know absolutely 100% what she's talking about. And I always say this, even in tournaments where I'm not fighting for a medal, but you're watching the people on the podium receive their medals and always the person in in gold is always really happy, obviously. And then you look and you see these two people who got third. Well, in judo, we have two third places. So you see all four of these people lined up on the podium and the two bronze medalists always look so happy. And then you have this silver medalist who, who placed higher than them. They made it completely all the way to the final. You got to remember. And they have this terrible dejected look on their face. So they're crying or they're upset. And that's because The worst thing about it is that even though you placed better, you had to end your day on a loss. You had to – the last thing on your mind, the last thing you're thinking of is what you did wrong and why this – you're not standing a a half a foot higher on the step next to you. And with a bronze medal, whether you make it to the semifinal and lose and you're coming through a loser's bracket um, or whatever, whatever the situation that put you in the bronze medal fight, you end on a win. And that was the thing that happened with me in London is I lost the semifinal. I mean, all my chances at a gold, the final that you live for and you dream for suddenly disappear. But I still had another chance for retribution. And, you know, there's nothing like a loss to completely turn your focus around and make you go, I will never let that happen again and light a spark inside you. And I think that 
um, it makes perfect sense that she felt that way. And obviously, it's still an amazing accomplishment, but she en- she ended by losing, and I think that's the thing that is so disconcerting in that situation. Marty, you completed your university degree during a time when you were very aggressively competing and training. So how were you able to prioritize and organize and keep your focus so that your university studies did not take away from judo and vice versa? Well, you, what it really came down to was prioritizing. I, I knew since, I didn't even know why, but ever since I was a teenager, I wanted to go to college. I don't know if I saw it as a way to get out of my small town or whatever it was, but that was something I really wanted to do alongside being an Olympic champion or being a world champion. So when it came to the part where I had to go, okay, I have to go to school all day, and I also held a job at the same time, I just realized that there are little time-saving things you can do and ways you can sit on the plane and make sure you're doing homework and make sure you're studying because we travel a lot. But there were days, Don't I'm not going to lie to you, that it was really hard. I'll never forget this hell semester I had where I had to go to a math class from 7 to 8.45, no, 7.15 to 8.45 in the morning, and then I would ride my bike to work from 9.30 to 2.30 where I was making sandwiches, and then I would go to my statistics class from 3 to 4.15, and then I would rush home, eat a little, get my stuff on, and go to judo from 5.30 to 7.30, and I was doing that four days a week, and like, at that point, I think you're just young and excited and resilient, and there's no amount of sleep that is going to stop you from achieving your goals. And, you know, I'm the kind of person that when the teacher would give us homework in the class and would be lecturing on what that homework is going to be about, I'm doing the homework. I'm doing it right then, listening to him lecture while I do the homework. And if I'm riding the bus home, I'm studying on the bus. And then that night, you know, you don't go out and party. you got to focus about weight training the next morning and, like, I guess, and what it really comes down to, if I'm just going to ramble on, is what sacrifices you're willing to make for the things you want. And there is a huge stigma, especially among judo players, where um, people commit their whole lives to the sport and then retire, and they look around and go, oh, my gosh, what do I do now? I've got kind of a beat-up body. I've got, I've got a few good results under my arm, but I never educated myself. I never really learned how the world worked. And that stigma was something that stood out a lot to me. And I wanted to make sure that no matter what happened, professionally, athletically, I was going to be okay. Marty, many of the guests that we've had on this show have pointed out that their relationships were greatly affected by being a professional fighter. And in fact, many of them have said that that was a major sacrifice, that they weren't able to get into relationships, or when they did, the relationships did not last because of how intense their training regimen was and so forth. Also, many of the fighters have said that when they had to stop fighting due to injury, it was then that they realized that they had to learn how to manage relationships and even just simple friendships in some cases. So were you able to manage relationships during the time that you were competing and training? I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, well, romantically, yes, because when I first moved to San Jose State when I was 18 years old, which, oh my gosh, that was 12 years ago. I just realized that. Um, I actually met a guy, his name is David, and he was a member of the Mexican national team, um, born in the United States, so he was a dual citizen, and he had decided to come to San Jose for the same reason as me, which was to go to school while getting a good education and a good judo education. And we met, and we've been together ever since for 12 years. And I think when it comes to those kind of relationships, it helps that they succeed because that person understands your lifestyle. He was doing the exact same thing as me. He knows the sacrifices, and he knows that I'm going to be gone for weeks or months at a time because he lived the same way. So for that, I was really lucky because they're completely patient and understanding that you've got to get up and go and that training is your number one priority. But when it comes to outside friendships, I've always found it hard to relate and or make time for people who are not in my sport and it's the same way as it is uh romantically because they just this is going to sound terrible but the average person just not does not understand what kind of sacrifices and time it takes to do what i do at least as a judo player and i'm sure most other martial arts as well and so you know most friends aren't okay with you saying yeah you know i'll give you a call next week or let's go have lunch and that not happening for 6 months and so <laughs> in that sense you kind of end up staying close to the people who have a similar lifestyle as you 
Marty, I began taking a martial art called Shirinji Kempo when I was 19 years of age. And one of the philosophies was we had to remain constantly self-aware of what we called our beginner's heart, which meant that same passion that we had during the honeymoon period, that dedication and excitement and positive energy. When we first started taking that martial art, we had to remind ourselves to always practice that and channel into that, no matter whether we took the martial art for five years, 10 years, or 20 years. And of course, like anything, the interest comes in peaks and valleys. And there were times throughout my instruction where I wondered if I wanted to continue doing it. So I'm just curious, during your competitive judo career that's ongoing, did you have peaks and valleys where your interest varied in judo? Um, there were definitely peaks and valleys, but the the thing about the peaks and valleys is that they were based on tournaments. They, it was those moments when you just couldn't get a break and you just couldn't win. And I had I had a few deep valleys for a while. You could even say I'm going through a valley right now, considering I didn't do so well in Rio this year. But whether or not that got rid of that beginner's mindset of always being passionate and excited about judo, I would have to say no, and that's because there's a rare thing in judo where you can go to any judo club around the around the country, I would bet, and you're going to run into some, like, 80-year-old dude with a black belt that's, like, so old and ragged that it looks gray. You can see the inner makings of the belt, and they're still showing up practicing their techniques or trying to improve. And I do seminars around the United States all the time, and I will run into these guys, and it kind of becomes intimidating because you go, okay, wait a minute, they've been doing judo for 50 years. They've been doing it for 24 years. Okay, there's nothing I can teach them that they don't know or that they're going to find helpful. What I've come to realize is that the true lovers of the sport and the people who keep that passionate, I just started feeling about it, are the are the ones that understand that judo is something that you can do your entire life and still never perfect. There's always something to be learned, and that keeps me – in that childish sense, even if I was a seven-time Olympian, which is impossible, um, I would still have that feeling because there's always some way I can improve when I go in there every day. And I think that that's the most important thing about martial arts in the end is how it improves your character or your willpower or your confidence. And judo never runs out of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I can certainly relate. It is very inspirational when you see some of these senior students, especially elderly students, that show up and they're training with such passion at that age. Well, yeah, and on top of that, like, in the judo world, you know, there comes a time where when you you gain a little bit of notoriety and I show up at a tournament or a club or I bump into judo people and they're so shocked and awed and excited and you kind of go, wow, you know, I've kind of accomplished something where I'm able to get this kind of recognition. And for me, it always, like, kind of, stops me in my tracks and then I go and meet these guys who I've probably seen it all they've met so many amazing people and they're still just so humble and willing to learn from this five foot three girl with a screechy voice who's coming and telling them how to do judo and that's something that I always try to remind myself of that you're always a student you know Marty did you have a plan for your judo afterlife in other words, your life after judo, after your competitive career, you are educated. Did you have a plan for the next iteration of your life once you were finished with competitive judo? I mean, I always, I, my undergrad was in advertising. My master's was in mass communication. And I knew that I was going to go into some type of marketing, advertising, social media, digital media kind of gig. What that is, I don't know yet. But I got my degrees with the personal intention of moving into the business world outside sports at one point of getting my feet dirty and putting my resume out there and showing that the work ethic and the dedication that I've had for my sport is something that transfers over into all avenues of my life. And, you know, I know that's not an easy thing to do and it could take a long time before I do any of that, but I'm excited at the prospect, you know, it, most martial artists are people who are in the peak of their of their careers can't see past the end of that career. And I've always, I don't know if it's from my um, time spent at San Jose State among a lot of successful business professionals that came through the same judo program as me, but I've always seen that as 
the way it was going to go. You know, what it's going to be exactly, I can't say. I'm I'm still competing now, so I don't need to decide that urgently, but I'm excited for it. Marty, would you consider yourself a fairly intense competitor, or are you fairly restrained and patient as a competitor? Um, I'm probably pretty intense. In my own opinion, I'd say probably pretty intense, and then based on the my training partners and my friends around me, they always say that I'm very intense, so I'd have to say that. Are competitive judo practitioners by nature generally more intense than, let's say, boxers or kickboxers? I don't know, and I don't know because I haven't done any of those things. And you, you know how it always is. You think you have an idea, and then you get put in the situation, and you realize that there's so many aspects and parts that you couldn't even conceive until you really tried it. So I don't want to say for sure, but I would say that the one thing about judo that makes it intense is that it's literally a fight. Like hands, all hands on deck, all feet, all toes. There's so many different aspects that are coming into play at one time in terms of speed and endurance and muscle strength and um, being dynamic and reacting to what the other person is doing. See, I'm explaining that. And if someone thought I was talking about boxing, I very well could be, you know. So (laughs) until I try, I, I can't really say. So recently I interviewed a UFC fighter who was on the Ultimate Fighter uh, television show during the season when uh, Ronda Rousey was one of the coaches. And one of the things that he remarked is he said when he encountered Ronda Rousey, he said she was uh, uh, very professional, uh, she was very engaging, could be extremely friendly. However, that intensity, that edge that you saw during interviews and during fights is always there. It's always on deck. And it made me wonder, is this common for judo, competitive judo practitioners, first of all? And secondly, is this something that's easy to manage so that the intensity is just there during competition? Or can that also be a challenge in terms of relationships in that you have to be able to control that intensity just day-to-day life during your interactions with people? No, it definitely follows you and. I think a lot of the times you don't realize it until you spend time with normal people. When I say normal people, I mean not martial artists. And, I mean, when it comes to, like, talking to a friend about maybe she wants to do – I have a friend from grad school who I meet with now and then, and she'll talk to me about, oh, I want to do this little project, but, you know, I'm not sure and I'm afraid. And when I start stepping into the mode where I'm advising her or – pushing her, trying to help her in some way, I get very intense and I get motivated and I tell, I'm sitting there telling her all the reasons she should and she shouldn't and she's looking at me and her eyes are getting all wide and she'll say, okay, okay, calm down, this isn't judo. Because she'll see that, like, that natural, competitive, get things done, work hard nature comes through in all aspects. And I try to tame it down. I am aware of it. I realize that not all people are psycho-focused, training animals in every aspect of their life, so... But I, I understand completely what he was saying about Rhonda because Rhonda actually possesses her own sense of intensity all the time. But she's always been like that. Even when she was a little kid, I used to fight her to judo, and she always had that same kind of just zeroed-in animal instinct, I guess you could say. So when you competed against Rhonda Rousey, you felt that intensity even at a very young age? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was just she was always that type of person like if anything she's consistent (laughs) now marty you have an incredible competitive record and of course this has taken you all around the world would you please share with us some of the fantastic places that you've traveled as a result of your judo career yeah um sure i mean france belgium italy spain netherlands uh, sweden finland russia azerbaijan kazakhstan Morocco, Venezuela, El Salvador, um, Brazil, Montreal, um, Japan, Korea, China, um, and most of those multiple times. I know I'm forgetting a bunch, but those are just the main ones we go to. We travel a lot to Eastern Europe. Judo is very popular there. Judo is very popular in Japan, also in Brazil. Um, all the basically all over the United States. That's the thing about judo is to get strong uh, people to train with. You can't look for it in the United States. We just don't have a deep enough uh, 
pool of people to pull from. So, for example, I was just speaking to my team manager before I started talking to you, and we're planning a trip to Austria in January for an Olympic training camp. To Austria? Yeah, we go there every year. It's, uh, the city is called Mietersil. It's up there in the mountains. <laughs> it's really cold. Marty, you have won countless me- medals in all sorts of different events worldwide, including the Pan Am Games and, of course, World Judo Championships. So here's my question. What do you see as the bigger accomplishment, uh, being a medalist in the Olympics, a medalist in the Pan Am Games, or a medalist in the World Judo Championships? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I-, I can explain why, but those are very hard decisions for me. One, because Pan Ams, I, I waited to the final, I think, two times and lost and got silver. And then when I finally took a gold, I consistently took gold three times in a row, which was very important to me. But, and I know most people want me to say the Olympic bronze is the most whatever, but the Olympics are huge to the world mostly because of how they're marketed. But in terms of difficulty, in judo, the world championships are much harder. And that's because at the Olympics, for example, in my category, I had about 20-something girls. At the World Championships, you can send two girls per weight. So instead of 20, you have up to 50 or 60. And most countries who send two people are sending two very strong people. So you you take a medal at the Worlds, you have gone through a very tough competition and a long competition. And as much as I've always wanted to become Olympic champion, I've always wanted to become world champion just as much. And to make it to the final of the World Championships while well, my coach, who was the first world champion for men, Mike Swain, ever, was coaching me alongside, is huge. So I want to lean on the, the world silver. But what most people don't know is that when I made it to the final of the world championships, I lost in under 30 seconds. So while it's my one of my favorite accomplishments, it's also one of my most embarrassing losses. And you are no doubt hardest on yourself about that. Oh, well, I mean, you got to look at it this way. I fought the Brazilian girl in Brazil in the final. <laughs> and, of course, Brazil, a big country for grappling arts. But you want to know the greatest thing about that is after I lost, um, that insane that crowd was going insane, and they're lined up right along the edge where you walk in and out. So you can't miss them. And I lost. Of course, you're trying not to cry and be upset, and I'm trying to just get out of the stadium as fast as I can. And all the Brazilian fans were reaching out and, like, patting me on the back and saying, good job, and we love you. It was the most amazing thing ever because they wanted me to lose a second before. And when I did, though, they were still, like, gracious to you as someone who came and tried anyway. You know, I, I really appreciated that. Marty, future vision and goals. What is next for you? I have one goal right now when it comes to judo, and that's to be a world champion um, next year, 2017 in August. The world championships will be in Budapest. I have not committed to another four-year cycle for 2020, so I'm focusing on one year at a time, and I cannot be happy with myself if I don't give myself one more shot at being world champion. So that's my main focus right now, one year from now. Well, we will certainly be rooting for you and have no doubt that you will make a reality of that goal. Our last question for our interview today, Marty, and thank you for joining us once again. This has been both enlightening and inspiring. Advice for our audience on pursuing epic goals, because you have no doubt pursued many epic goals in your career as a competitive judo practitioner. Advice on pursuing life's epic goals, whether they are in martial arts, career, or everyday life, or educational pursuit, epic goals? I guess the most important thing is to have a goal in the first place. When my Olympic cycle time started coming to an end, I started feeling this anxious feeling, saying, what's next? What's next? And I think the most important thing is to have a goal, no matter matter how big or small it is, whether it's um, getting up and going to the gym every day and staying active or pursuing a job or um, making your relationships with people around you better. I think that you have to always be working towards something. And I don't think that there's anything 
you can't do if you want to. I really, really believe that if it's what you want to do, you can achieve it. So just make sure that you're chasing the right thing. Otherwise, people always are like, oh, it just it didn't work out or I couldn't do it and it was hard. And, and when they say that, I realize that they didn't really want it in the first place. You, ha- you, you can say you want it, but you have to show how much you want it by taking the active steps to make it a reality. And I know that sounds vague, but that's what I do. <laughs> Marty, great advice, great interview, and thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show today. Oh, you're very welcome. I appreciate you having me on. This has been an interview with Olympic judo medalist Marty Malloy. And by the way, Marty is available for keynotes, clinics, lectures, and appearances. You can find out more about her availability by checking out her website at www.martymalloy.com. Be sure to check out our website at www.mawradio.com and check out the advertisement for London Sports, a manufacturer of quality equipment and apparel at factory prices, which you can brand for your students and customers. Just click on the London Sports advertisement to send your inquiry. This is UFC fighter Jason Sago. You are now listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Martial Arts World Radio is distributed worldwide on a network which includes broadcast stations, internet radio stations, podcast platforms, listen-on-demand channels, and, of course, social networks. If you would like to add your station to our network or if you wish to sponsor the show, reach out to me by email at producer at mawradio.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. Thank you for listening.